Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss data as a profit driver, emerging technologies to monetize data as a strategic asset. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the top right-hand corner of your screen to activate that feature. Feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, in the, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA Strategies. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker of the series, Donna Burbank. She is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Always fun to do these. Um, and as Shannon mentioned, um, I am a regular speaker at Dataversity. We have a monthly series on data architecture. Um, and a question that often comes up at the end is, will this be recorded? And the answer is yes. So they are all on demand. So if any of those previous recording uh, topics are of interest to you, they are all out on the Dataversity website. And I believe, Shannon, correctly if I'm wrong, I think they're up there forever. So um, any of the past ones this year or last are always available. Um, and we have some other topics coming up. So if this is your first time joining us, welcome. Um, there'll hopefully be a, a, an interesting mix of topics for the rest of the year. So today's topic, <clears throat> as Shannon mentioned, is about data as a profit driver. Um, and there's there's the buzzword of of monetization, and there's, I would say it's not a buzzword anymore because it's just become reality. Because the digital economy is here to stay, and, it, and data is really transforming the way companies are doing business. Um, and it, it really is the new norm. I was sort of chatting with Shannon before the call, and I have several clients right now doing looking at ways they can monetize, and there's several ways to do it. So some of you may say. Isn't this just what we've always been doing, but better data helps us be more profitable? And the answer is yes, um, but there's also some new exciting ways as well. So I'm going to talk about all of those and a little bit of definitions of what does that actually mean? Like with anything, when big data was the buzzword, what does big data mean? Is that, just, you know, and are we misclassifying certain things? So as a data person, I'm a metadata person, I'm always a fan of definitions. So we'll start with that. Um, so this is a definition from Gartner on sort of what is data monetization. So the basic uh, definition is using data for quantifiable economic benefit, right? So that could be, as I mentioned, just improving business performance. And that might be the cynic in you saying, haven't we all been doing this? Yes. But how do we quantify that? How do you actually show ROI? That's often the elusive part of a project that you know you're doing a good, good job and you know you're making things more efficient. But are we, how are we actually tracking that and showing that back up to upper management? Because that often can be hard to explain. You, if you've ever heard me uh, present, you're, I always stress the you need to market, you need to sell, you need to have your elevator pitch, because you will always be competing with other projects. Um, and there's always the new shiny thing with management, and you want to make sure that they continue to know that data is really driving the business, and that needs to be something supported, funded, understood. So we'll get more into the different ways we can monetize in the in the this slide. So there's many ways. I, I think it's helpful to sort of break it into three different buckets. So that first bucket is the one we may be most familiar with, and I don't want to say it's the easiest to quantify, but it's something you could probably start doing right today with your business without having to be the next Uber, right? It's something you can do no matter what your organization. How are we using the better data to better optimize revenue, minimize costs, and reduce risk? Those are sort of the three tenets of any organization, right? We want to make as much revenue as we can by minimizing costs, and reducing risk because that's that's always the big bugbear that could can really get you get you in trouble. 
So there's also, though, I think the, the second two columns are the most exciting and get me interested in, in why I'm still in data. Um, you know, I remember earlier in my career, I was an economics major first, and there was sort of, I love tech, but I also like business, and do I have to choose? Well, you don't have to choose anymore. Right? <laughs> A lot of the big organizations are data-driven, and, and having both uh, skill sets in your toolkit can be very helpful, and we'll talk more about that. But there's new products and services, either embedding analytics into products, um, new things. We'll give some examples of companies we've worked with, things like smart metering with, with Internet of Things. Are there data sets you can sell? Uh, do you have weather data? Do you have customer data? Do you have whatever you can sell ethically, of course, um, where you can really get value literally monetizing your data. But I think most exciting, right, and we all sort of hope we'll have that next big billion-dollar company like an Uber or, or a Facebook or whatever, um, of, of taking data and thinking, what new business opportunity can I have with this new data I'm, I'm have, I, I have available to me? Or the new platforms and technology, sometimes the data was there, but we didn't have the scalability, the cloud or the interconnectedness that we've had today. So a lot of perfect storm is coming together when it comes to data to really start to profit from it in ways we could not before. So let's go into the first use case and we'll spend the most time there because as I mentioned, that's probably the most practical thing you can start doing today in your own home, right, <laughs> your own company, of how do I improve my core business using data? And we'll go through each one of these. So <clears throat> I will just start by just, just saying to remember this, right, and I've done it myself. We get so tied up in the project itself, it's really interesting. We're doing a new analytics project or we're building an Internet of Things and integration, and you sort of forget to stop and say, what's the value of this? Because uh, whether we like it or not, part of our job is always marketing. As I mentioned in the beginning, you're always competing with another project, another shiny thing, another budget cut, and you have to continually keep yourself top of mind. So whenever I start a project, I like to think, what's the end goal and how we, wh when this is successful, and not if, hopefully, um, how are we going to show the value? Are there KPIs we can show? And consider your audience. And, and I, as a consultant, I work with a lot of different types of companies. And, and consider what your audience is most interested in. Is it you're a new startup and it's all about revenue? I've had one CEO say to me, I don't care about the cost. We're just in revenue gaining mode. And no matter how much it costs, we'll spend it. Yes, that's what you want to hear, right? <laughs> you know, how much it costs, we'll spend it to grow the revenue. Often it's the opposite. We didn't have a good quarter. The biggest thing right now is cutting costs, and we have to show how data can help make things more efficient, or generally it's a combination of both of those in, in a mix, right, of, of how, do I, how do I make the most money and spend the least. Um, often risk is a big thing. I've been brought into companies because, unfortunately, they had an audit um, and, and something went wrong, or they had been sued by somebody. Or, I mean, depending on the industry, insurance, they live and breathe risk. That's really their algorithms of how to reduce risk. So when you're making your case, you don't want to make the wrong case, right? You don't want to go to a startup Silicon Valley CEO and be all about the risk of this new opportunity. They may need to think of that, but they're probably thinking revenue, right? So think of what the – all of these three things are good to track, um, uh, but think of what the balance is that your audience wants to hear. And often those anecdotes um, can help. So hard numbers are always good, um, but sometimes it's the anecdote. And then also think of your audience, right? Um, I had a great anecdote to a, for a CIO of an insurance company, and she wanted to see numbers. She's like, yeah, I know the gut feel, but I don't live by gut feel. <laughs> I, I, I live by numbers. So, again, I don't want to overstress that, but think of the right thing that at the end of the project you can say, hey, this is what we did, and this is why it was successful. So minimizing costs. It's often the easiest to show, and, and I, I don't want to oversimplify it, but I know one of the big ones, and, and if you've heard any of my other webinars, we've had some you know, statistics of, of the average data scientist, depending on the study, can spend 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of their day cleaning data or finding data or, or trying to get access to data they don't have, right? And not only are those expensive resources, but it leads to people not being interested in their job. But they want to, you want to do the cool algorithms. You want to give the results, not trying to find data or deduplicate data, right? So can you quantify that? Can you say, um, and I would say be conservative because this is, you know, there's sometimes skepticism with that. People can think you're inflating. So just say, Mary, the data scientist, she spends just 10 hours a week cleaning data. That's probably a huge under assessment, right? And say she makes $50 an hour, 10, 10 hours a week, maybe she makes 46 
uh, weeks out of the year because she has vacation and training and things like that. So you can say that's just one person. We lose efficiency of $23,000 a year. So if we had better data through master data or data quality or whatever, that's really making your most valuable resources more more cost effective. And, and I wouldn't just limit it to tech. That's often the easier one, but you could say the marketing team. There was a customer we worked with, a small nonprofit actually outside of London, and we did they for each marketing campaign. They obviously didn't have a huge tech department. It was a small nonprofit, but uh, their their marketing team before each monthly campaign literally spent a week getting the data together, and they would do the same thing every month. It was really redundant information. So this this organization actually got the budget to spend quite a bit of money on a new tool, a new tool set with data quality and metadata and things like that, because when they actually did the hours of how much their marketing team spent every a week out of every month <laughs> basically getting ready for the campaign, they said that's something a tool could do. So that that for them, that was their big justification. And that's something management didn't see. They saw the campaign. That was great. They didn't realize how many hours behind the scene. Once they realized that, they said, this is how many hours just spent getting the data right? Can't we automate that? So again, that in that particular case, now I've used this one a lot with several different you know projects. It's often an easy, easier one to show because you have hourly rates and you have time, and that's sort of an easier one. Can you improve inefficient business processes? So I mentioned that marketing one um, as an inefficient process that it just took a long time to get a campaign out. You can't stop doing campaigns. You need to. Can you make it more efficient? Um, supply chain is often one. Um, they, they, you know, we we need better material master data. We need better supplier information. And perhaps you can either get real time efficiency or percentages, and that's often an easy thing, easier thing to quantify. How much actual percentage of uh, business process improvement can we have? Another one is cost avoidance. And again, be really creative in this. Just look. Think of everything with a data lens. And, and it may just be obvious, but we've never spent that time to actually calculate it. We just know it, but we've never sort of calculated that, calculated that beginning and end. Um, one of my clients, we were trying to justify a master data management tool, and they want to do some data cleansing. And in this case, um, it was a healthcare company that actually had to send out physical mailings. I know we often do email, but they did a lot of physical U.S. mail mailings, and a lot of the addresses are wrong, and, and they had them returned. You know, and they were doing mailings every week, every month, and some of them were packets of things. You know, they were a big, heavy thing, and it cost as much as a, you know, I just picked a dollar, but they were fairly expensive marketing, and they say you had 500 returned per week over 50 weeks. That can be as much as $25,000 a year just because of address cleansing, right? So, again, these are just three uh, that I've used that you could use, but just think of that. It might not be something you've thought of before, of just sitting down and quantifying it. Um, but that cost avoidance is an excellent one to show that if we were to do this right, because often if you're kicking off a project, there is a spend, and we'll talk about this. You may need training for a new tool. You need you need to buy a new tool. You might need consultancy to help you get kickstarted, et cetera, et cetera. Or it may be your team just taking a little longer doing things because you're building something new. Um, so you'll have to justify why that extra spend is going to save more in the long run. Um, so one cost is mitigating a longer term cost, if that makes sense. The other one, and it's sort of more fun and more, you know, everyone likes to optimize making money rather than saving money. It's just a little more interesting. Um, so in, in one sense, you can optimize revenue by reducing the inefficiencies we talked about before, right? If we didn't have our marketing team cleaning up the addresses, they could actually be doing marketing, right? And I've had that across the board in almost every industry I've worked with. I had... Um, it was in a university, and they were trying to do research, and they couldn't do research because they were cleaning the data, right? So you can sort of often kind of quantify that. Uh, improve business performance. So I, I keep mentioning marketing, but marketing is, is good for several reasons. One, it's one of those companies, if it's making money for the company. So they often get a lot of attention. They're often very numbers-focused, right? Marketing is all about KPI, click-through rates, um, net promoter score, all of that. So... Uh, and we'll talk later in the presentation. Can you track actual metrics that help improve a cap uh, K marketing KPI? If we had, a if we actually had 100% email addresses, our campaign effectiveness would be better. Um, could it be that we're adding new data sources? If we had social media sentiment analysis, that would help our net promoter score. If we could get weather data and put it in our data lake, we could see why shopping patterns when it was snowing 
we shouldn't do our marketing campaign or, or something like that, right? So often marketing is good because they do track metrics so closely. And if you can align your efforts with those metrics and how they improved, all the better, right? Um, advanced analytics, again, you may be doing this, and that's often a good one to show because analytics is often showing those very KPIs. If we could do price optimization uh, with this new analytics, with this right data, we could make you this much more money because we could optimize price by customers. Customer segmentation is another um, often used advanced analytics technique, and you can put those two together. If we could segment our customers by certain groups, we could have different, you know, think of the airlines. They do that all the time. I know I get charged a lot. <laughs> the, more I, the more I fly with them, the more I get charged, right, because they know I'm a captive customer because I travel a lot for work. Um, but that, that type of thing you can do for your, your own customer segmentation. The other thing in this, this, uh, these three buckets, whether it's a new application, whether it's improving your current business, you can argue about what bucket it falls in. So this may be in the other buckets. But new data-driven applications, so chatbots, right? Uh, how many people have um, gone to customer service and you have, you know, Mary the chatbot talking to you instead of uh, a human. Sometimes that's annoying. Sometimes that's really nice. Uh, I work with a university and they actually had, you know, who loves to work with financial aid? Nobody, right? So they were, had the study that, you know, students were actually not able to come to school because they weren't able to get their aid. They weren't able to get their aid because calling financial aid was difficult or they were embarrassed. So they actually preferred going to a chatbot. They could just talk to this person that isn't a person and get the right answers. Or, you know, I, I just want to call my cell phone company and, and get a question about a service. I don't really need to call who talks on the phone anymore. Right? And chatbots are great because you can embed things like AI and they can learn better over time just like a human. But you need good data to do that. Um, I have one customer who was working on this type of technology and they didn't have the right product codes. So it was hard if someone uh, called in and asked for a part this was their manual support team, but even a human, they couldn't they couldn't find the right part because the part codes were wrong, right? So, again, often that's hard for management to understand. So can you try to monetize that? We could save your valuable support reps, have them focused on the things they need a human being for, and save money by having a tap bot to do the typical stuff that these people don't want to have to answer the same question 100 times a day. Um, so again, that could be something that can be monetized. Recommendation engines, um, that's often excellent. You know, think of uh, Amazon.com, purchase this, would you like this? That can sort of enhance the sales cycle and help monetize revenue streams. Um, also, can your data actually be sold? Can you sell some different uh, data or can you get um, new revenue streams? Uh, we'll talk more about that later, but one of the, if you're a nonprofit or university, Often to get your grants, there's a whole lot of data-driven analysis. I have one nonprofit customer, um, and I think when we were trying to, they were again trying to buy some software, and I think the the line that sold it is that data is what's keeping the money coming in. If we don't show how we're meeting our grant objectives and how many people we've served in this nonprofit and how we're improving, we're not going to get the grants. So we need to have better data. And I'm sure you have something similar, especially if you are a grant-driven organization. Um, is there is there data your company owns? We'll talk more about this. That could be monetized for who else might be interested in this data we could have. As always, think of ethics, right? You don't want to sell customer PII and things like that or health information. But is it something that could be anonymized or is fairly, um, you know, non-threatening that we could that somebody else would be interested in that we use every day? And again, we'll talk more about that. But that's often when we think of monetization, you're literally selling your data sets uh, to another group that might be interested. Reducing risk. Oh, I'm going. Um, did I just go to the wrong slide? It's been one of those days. Um, where did my slide go? Um, I'm sorry. I have not had this happen before. Um, here we go. <laughs> reducing risk. Reducing risk of fat fingering your own slide. Um, so this is often something that it's not, I don't think, I mean, some people love this sort of stuff. They sort of live on um, compliance. It isn't what gets me up every day. It's sort of, I would rather not be brought in to have us not be sued as a company to do data, but it is something you can't forget. So GDPR, if you're not compliant, you should be. If you have customers in Europe or you're, you have um, anything in Europe, you want to start thinking of that. Uh, you can get sued. 4% of your global revenue, right? Or if you're a healthcare company, I'm sure you're aware of, of HIPAA or BCB. You know, these should be familiar to you. And that's often what helps drive data because you can't not do lineage. You can't not have data um, if you're in any of these in industries. 
Um, but those are kind of the big ones. We don't want to get audited. But even within a company, even without regulation, you probably want to reduce your risk. So product traceability is an, inter an interesting one, especially with consumers being more interested in the food they're eating and where it came from. Um, I had one a company I work with, um, and they had uh, they sort of sold food, right, and fish, and a lot of people were interested in where that fish came from. So they actually had the lineage of when you bought a piece of fish or a canned product of fish, you could trace it back to the ship it came on. That's all data-driven, right? And you can't do that without good data of where my food came from. Or if there's a health risk and you're selling a, a food and there was somehow um, food poisoning, how do I track that back? So often that kind of product traceability. Health and safety sort of ties into what we have. So it could be employee health and safety. Uh, one of the manufacturing companies I work with, it's really interesting. They're doing sort of a uh, driver tracking. They have truck drivers that are driving along. Um, and health and safety of, with any manufacturing company is always top of mind. But they actually had an app that if that driver was speeding, um, they would immediately know it was a real-time data-driven app. Um, and A, they could track over time where there's certain um, Drivers that were always speeding, uh, could we alert that driver real time? Hey, slow down, we're watching you, which I'm sure the driver loved, but <laughs> but that is a big piece of their business. Were there certain areas where drivers were always speeding? Um, and we'll talk more about that um, when we talk about data monetization because they had a lot of great GPS type data that they were able to monetize because they, they could see where drivers were going in road conditions. Um, but again, that, that was one area that actually helped employee health and safety, which was a big part of reducing risk. Your whole business is drivers and trucks. You don't want them speeding and driving off the road. Um, or it could be the customer information. A restaurant chain I worked with, and, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, a lot of restaurants now have nutritional information on the menu, either calorie or allergens, um, and it's actually some federal requirements there. So if I'm allergic to nuts, and this menu did not say that this had nuts in it, um, and I have an issue, then th there's some lawsuits there, right? Or if it's, you know, I'm vegan and it has meat. Um, so a lot of that is data-driven. Then they had to track each of their supply chain food items and where it came from and what the nutritional things were, um, and that was a big risk for them. You know, audit fines, so again, that's sort of with the regulation one up front, but um, unfortunately, again, when you're telling the story of success, were there fines that already happened? Often that's what kind of sells it. Remember we had that $50,000 fine last year? We don't want that to happen again. Again, that's I don't love to start with that kind of stuff, but it often gets people's attention. Um, um, litigation is similar. You know, was there ever a lawsuit based on data? Could there be a lawsuit? Um, and that often gets people's attention as well. So often it's a combination of all of those things that actually puts together and tells the story. And I would say, you know, we, we just talked about part of your job is marketing. Part of your job is also finance. Um, some people, nerds like me, find that sort of fun and interesting. Some of you may cringe. That's not why you went into IT. That's why you didn't go into finance. But it's good to at least be a little bit literate in what people are looking for. So. Some of those items you might want to put in the back of the envelope, uh, back of the envelope calculation. Maybe just name drop or put it in a PowerPoint presentation. But I've had luck just doing a little extra credit um, and actually putting it in a full, full financial spreadsheet. You may want to get help from finance if this isn't your strength. Um, but often they're happy to help you because this is helping them, right? Is there a projection you use that you would like us to fill in of how we can best show you the ROI from our project? I had one. Um, finance team, they sat down next to me and we, we did this together and, and it actually was very helpful for me because there were things they looked at that I had not thought of. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So it's often good. Some of those things we talked about, again, it's, it's benefits and costs. Often it comes down to that. So could it be a one-time benefit? You know, we got a research grant as a result of this data or we would get a research grant. If we could get the data about how we served our members, we could potentially get this $50,000 grant or whatever it is or a million dollar grant. Could there be recurring benefits? So the fact that Mary's more in, in, in productive because she does spend 10 hours a day cleaning data, that could be quantified over time. Could we reduce the mailing costs um, again over time? So just like benefits and costs, you might have a one-time purchase of software. You might have to do initial training, um, but there's also maybe recurring. So it could be subscription cost over time or maintenance. That's often one people forget about the software, but if you're doing that kind of software structure, there's also other costs over time. You might also want to consider CapEx versus OpEx. And just dropping those names makes you sound like a finance person, right? Um, but uh, that is often why some people are going to the cloud because capital, um, 
operational expenditure expenditure is easier to, to justify. But that's not always the case. So again, speak to finance. I had some clients that they actually wanted it to be a, a capital expenditure because of the way they were doing their books. That's what they wanted to see. So again, if you're really going to put together the case, it's probably good to to know what the goals are. Again, I had one customer that said it does not matter cost. We're only looking at revenue this quarter because we're in startup mode. Other companies are very cost avoidant, and, and, and so you want to, when you're making the case, make sure you're making that right case. Another good thing to think of um, is kind of a realistic break-even point and, and even quantifying that. So often, and it's just, just the reality, to start making money or saving money, you often have to spend money. Um, and so often your your chart that you put together sort of looks like the one on the right. That there's going to be an initial period where you're being less efficient because we have to buy some software. We have to train our people. We have to get some consulting. We The people we're working with are, are spending time setting this up. But then at a certain point, you start being more pro profitable. So it might be a good thing to throw in, hey, there's a certain break point that we know it's going to be more expensive, but by August, we really start to be able to show you some value. And that's good to the level set, too, because you could have sold this great story, and a month later they say, how come we're not making money yet? <laughs> so you want to be clear how long it's going to take, and level set uh, with your management if that's the right initiative to show. Another thing we should have talked to, but I want to show an example of, I'm a big fan of data quality KPIs. If you have any data governance um, council meets, I always love to show these in each council meeting, how are we improving over time with data. It's often good to actually link this with business KPIs where you can. So again, marketing is always a, a popular one because they look at that so closely. If we had better, if we had complete email addresses and 90% of them were accurate, uh, we augmented some data, we can increase campaign effectiveness by X. And if you're on the call and you're in IT, it might be good to get a sponsor with you from someone like marketing that will help you commit to that. Yes, this is really important to us. And start looking at, um, I've had some companies that would start start email campaigns and historically they've been in business for 50 years. Most of their customers had physical addresses but didn't have email addresses. That wasn't part of their business process. So you might want to start looking at that as well. That what is the best way to start monetizing information and what data is important. And so maybe we have new data sets we should be looking at that we hadn't before. Maybe it's email. I mean, I'm sorry, maybe it's social media. If we're looking at you know, net promoter score and we want to start tracking social media activity, Maybe that's something we need to track. So again, trying to, and here I think the examples, we just have some numbers in terms of what's important, but you can actually try to link this actually to, you know, try to get commitment of actual physical um, revenue numbers. Um, and this can be done. So some of you may be rolling your eyes and say, yeah, that sounds great, but really, A, I don't have time for this. Can you really justify these numbers? Um, and yes, and here's a case study. Uh, it's a little bit dated now, but we use this partly because one of the people on our team, if you're familiar with Nigel Turner over in the UK, he, sh he helped lead this project, the project initially and kick it off. Um, and he spent a lot of time at BT, British, I guess it was called British Telecom in the past. Um, so again, they were a multinational telecommunications company. And as any big company, they had troubles with business agility and regulatory compliance and customer satisfaction and all of the regular things. And this is that perfect case of just business as usual activity. And so part of the problem they were able to quantify it was poor customer data, poor supplier data, inaccurate inventory, just things like trying to get a bill out to people. Well, they were able to quantify it, and you can see the number there. I should have jumped right out to you. They were able to quantify over 80, 800 million U.S. dollars from their data, directly from their data quality improvement. So it was, again, part of all of the things we actually talked about of avoiding some costs um, by having better data. Um, actually, they were able to kind of target that they had improved some revenue um, and productivity gains was a big one for them rather than wasting time kind of trying to get the data together. Um, so this was well documented. It was actually published in Gartner. Uh, we have the publication number there if you want to read more about it. But if there were any naysayers in the call, this proves that it can be done and actually spending the time. So of course, they probably, um, on the project, this took time to do. It might have been a little inefficient. They didn't get maybe as many reports out that week because they were tracking some of this, but in the long run, it certainly paid off in terms of paying off the data quality, but also they were able to show results from their work, and this is what we always want to do. So kind of back to my, my point in the beginning of it's so easy to say I'm too busy to do this, and, and the most important thing people care about is the deliverable I'm going to give, and that's true, and they may not even realize it, but just take the extra time of where are we today in terms of productivity, revenue, 
risk and then where are we in six months or and keep tracking that, especially again, I'm a big fan of things like dashboards and data quality and add profitability to that. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of uh, hope that <laughs> yes, this can be done and these numbers can actually realistically be achieved. So now more into maybe the traditional data monetization, what new things can we do with data? Um, what new products and services can we offer? So I like to call this kind of using data for strategic advantage. So there's some. Um, one, I've seen several of my customers use this idea of embedded analytics, is sort of a hot topic. One is it was a big uh, distribution company, and they were actually able to sell analytics back to their customers. So several things. One, which for their very large customer, think of a big retail chain. They actually had thousands of uh, sites across the U.S., and they weren't able themselves to even see the buying patterns or the efficiencies across those companies. So this, this, this distributor was actually able to sell some of that back to them because they had better visibility into that than the customer themselves. Also, they had sort of data sharing agreements and it was anonymized. They were able to uh, share with the customer how they were comparing against industry average. So you, know, you are a, a US wide company, it looks like your stores in Massachusetts are a little less um, efficient than your ones in California. You may want to look at that. But compared to industry average, you're actually doing better than most. You know, that, that's something that these companies had never actually seen, and they were willing to pay for that. Um, things like smart metering. We'll have a use case, uh, actually, in the next slide. We'll talk more about that. Oh, think of Internet of Things um, and data that was never available before. It could be a new service of actually metering um, energy usage and, and things like that. And again, the one we mentioned before, actually getting revenue from data sets. And these are all real cases. So, um, you know, a meteor, think of a weather company, meteorology. I have a, I live in Boulder, Colorado, and I have a lot of weather nerd friends, and two of them own their own company just selling weather data. Um, because why is that important? You're a retailer. You want to know what, what weather patterns for sales cycle. You're an engineering company. You're a drilling company. You're a, you know, almost so much depends on a shipping company. So much depends on weather, either macro weather patterns across the globe um, or micro weather patterns of certain regions. So that's something, again, you might think, I do weather for a living. Who cares? A lot of people care. <laughs> and that's not new. They've been doing that for a while. Um, but again, think of that with your, your own company. What do we have uh, that someone else might be interested in? Um, the nonprofit I mentioned is actually very, very data savvy. They were, they have a very unique um, demographic of people they're trying to help, um, and of course they anonymized it. <laughs> but um, a lot of universities were very interested in some of this data for their own research, and they were actually able to get a large chunk of money for some local universities for doing research on that data because no, but they had been in business for I think over 30 years. And no one had sort of time sequence data for that type of demographic um, for that long of time. So again, they, who would have thought that this small nonprofit um, actually was able to monetize their data, but they were very unique. And you probably have something unique. Um, the shipping company I mentioned that, that again, was looking its drivers. Um, again, the drivers probably weren't a fan of that. But because they had this GPS-enabled technology, a lot of their shipping routes were in very rural areas um, where, yes, we have ways and we have uh, MapQuest and we have a lot of you know, ways we can now get um, geolocation data on our cell phone, but not in these rural areas. And it was a very unique, can a big truck go on this road? And are there any gotchas that you can't cross this river because your truck is too heavy or whatever, right? Nobody else had that really unique kind of information. So they're now investigating, creating their own kind of, you know, Ways or map quest or whatever for shipping um, in rural areas because again nobody else has that they're the only ones that really have that data so again what data does your company have that you can either sell out right and just anonymize and here's my data set or is there some sort of new product or service either to your own cu customers or new customers that maybe you hadn't thought of um, here's an example in, in my next use case is a company we worked with in the UK that really did both and and so. I'm a big fan, is it either or, or could it be an and? If you want to do some of this new sexy stuff, you often are also helping your core business that you've been doing for a long time, because the beauty of data is that it helps a lot of different areas. So this was a UK energy company we worked with. In a way, this is a, a really strange use case in that um, energy is something that's decreasing, and they're actually trying to incent their customers to use less energy. 
So what, what product company does that? You know, I sell Coca-Cola. I want you to buy less of it. That's just weird. You don't normally do that, right? But this was the type of industry that you do that. So yes, they could keep getting more efficient and more and more efficient and more and more efficient, but unless you're getting more revenue, that's kind of a never end. That's not an, a winning game. So, so they had several issues with that. And they, what they wanted to do is really get into the smart metering and smart home products. And you know, we're all sort of used to this now, but this was sort of several years ago where I, I want to see my energy home usage from my cell phone. I see that it suddenly got cold and I want to turn down the, the heat because I'm spending too much money during the day when I'm not home. Um, I want to see my energy tracking over time. I want to see that this window is leaking and you know, heat and I could maybe buy some weather stripping from the company, right? All of that. And they wanted to head to that and they did. And they were moving all from traditional databases to Hadoop and Internet of Things and all this great stuff. But they also had trouble with just their core data, um, just getting the bills out and the payments correct. Um, getting, actually, it was sort of funny, one of our consultants on site, um, he had supposed to have a, um, a technician come to his house to fix his, his whatever connection. Um, and they couldn't find his house because he had the wrong address, which <laughs> was exactly, and he was late to work and all this big problem. And it was funny because that's exactly what we were trying to fix. And so they need, knew to get to this next generation of data and data monetization, and they had you know the signs on the wall that we want to be a data-driven company, they had to start with the basics. So they had some basic data architecture. Do we even know what the critical data elements are? Should we start with just customer name, address, billing information? Do we have the governance around that? What is data quality? As I just mentioned, it was not good. So they needed to improve that, as well as things like that platform scale. Billy, I can't do this on a relational database. We needed to move to more of a big data platform. So they did all that. And the beauty of that is that that was both of those pillars. It was strengthening their traditional data model, and it also set the foundation to really transform their business into new smart meter and home smart products. And I've I've been sort of following them. We're not there on site anymore. And they keep they keep launching new new products because once you have the new data, I mean your data in a nice format, you can do these new innovative things much more quickly. But you have to get that foundation. So uh, moving ahead, uh, another company we work with, and actually this was in the UK as well. Um, Another one that kind of leads into that second of how do we have a whole new business model? Again, telco is sort of a, I don't know, it's a commodity, right? A lot of it is just the network, um, and you sort of expect that your phone company is going to have a good network. So they were able to use their data to improve their core business. They could kind of track the phones and see where performance outages were. They could see how customers were using their product to see how it was working. So that was good. Um, but the bigger part was really new data monetization opportunities. And this is where the creep factor comes in. <laughs> and this company actually was very good at anonymizing. But your cell phone company knows a lot of what you're doing. It knows where you're going. It knows who you're talking to. There's a lot of data in there. But that can be very valuable. So one of the thing, one of the many things they had, had a long list of things they were doing, um, because they do have that valuable data, and that's a perfect example of our core business is interesting enough, and that we're making profit. But we have really interesting data, and how can we make profit off the data itself? So they anonymized all this data. They knew everywhere people were going across the city. Um, and they were actually able to do some things. They were able to sell some of that, what they call it footfall analytics, back to city planners to say, okay, at rush hour, where are people going? Should we build a new um, train platform? Should we build a new uh, pedestrian walkway? Because they could actually see realistically where people were going in the city. Um, they did some things with the retailers. So I think we're all familiar with kind of loyalty programs. And they're great, and you get a discount. But the other thing they're doing is they know what products you're buying, and and and, and your sort of patterns and things like that. So yes, there's a benefit. That they're also getting value from your data as well. But several of the large retailers in the UK didn't have that program, and they weren't set up for it. So they actually used the footfall traffic from the cell phone to see where people were buying food and actually how were their store layout. So I go to the grocery store, I bill, buy milk, and then I walk all the way across the store to buy cheese. Maybe we should buy milk and cheese together, you know. Um, so they were actually able to see some great retail patterns from cell phone data, which was kind of interesting. 
they also did it internally. Um, I did not opt in for this because I am a day paranoid. I'll, just, <laughs> I'll say that right now. Um, but it was neat because you had your cell phone and they could do patterns of, they were actually looking to expand their campus and how employees were traveling between business buildings. Do we need a new lunchroom? Because everybody from all six buildings is going to this one lunchroom we have. Do we, should we buy another? How are office um, conference rooms being used? When do people leave every morning and, and in the evening? So they actually, and they showed some interesting graphics of how their own employees were moving back and forth from that cell phone data. So again, cell phone was their, you know, telco was their business, but data was their real business, um, <laughs> their augmented business, because they were actually getting a lot of revenue from that as well. Um, so again, hopefully some of these are light bulbs in your own mind of where, where you might be able to have some new ideas. So the, the third bucket is, um, is, I think what we all sort of often we think of with um, you know new business models, who can be the next Uber or the next Facebook or the next whatever. And I've, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. It's sort of no surprise that some of the largest companies on the planet and the most successful companies are data driven, right? Think of Amazon, Uber, Lyft. Um, you know, all the all the big ones we all talk about are all data driven, and we're driven kind of from data, ways to use data we hadn't before. Um, so to go more deeply into that, and I think this is what I think is just sort of fun to think of new ideas. So a lot of cities are doing sort of smart city initiatives with IoT, uh, smart parking. You know, this is one they had years ago, and it makes so much sense. Of um, There are sort of an, an internet, of things, the internet of things sensors, and can you see where the parking is available from your smartphone? Um, football analytics, I already talked about. Um, there's been some fun things, actually a city where near where I used to live in Italy, Switzerland, they actually had trash cans. And I tried to find the picture of it for this presentation and I couldn't, it was a couple of years ago. They had trash cans that would tell the trash collectors when they were full because they had sensors on them. Um, that was a wealthy town in Switzerland, uh, Italy border, but so they could have sort of afford to spend the money on telling when the trash cans were full. But it, it, it's interesting. And think of all the other things you could be doing with things like smart city and internet of things and um, you know pedestrian tracking and things like that. The one we're all, it, it sounds funny when we say peer-to-peer -peer ride sharing. It's sort of like saying facial tissue when everyone says clean it next, right? We just say we're going to take an Uber or a you know, they're so ubiquitous now. It's even funny to use that word, but that's what it is, right? And that's all data-driven. And I have an example on the next slide about that, um, kind of how they use data. Social networking is another huge one. That's basically graph type databases with large data sets and, and relations between people. Um, again, they've had some negative press, some of those in the news. So ethical use is always, but there's always some really great opportunities. Um, and I will never be a billionaire because I always seem to miss, I, I still remember when they had cell phones out and I said, why would you put a camera on the cell phone? I, I, <laughs> I still sort of wonder. Um, but me for some of the next new trends. Um, but I have a friend here at Boulder, Colorado, is near where I live, and sort of it's a startup central like a lot of cities are. Um, and I had one friend that I used to go rock climbing with, and he was always talking about this cool, he had a startup, but you know, so many people do. And, and I asked him what it was, and it was it was basically social media. It was way, it was, it was about seven years ago. And, and it was an API that kind of, kind of connects social media sites to get usage data and, you know, whatever. Uh, he sold to about $150 million a few years ago. And now I see him on Facebook traveling around India and all these great things. But he basically found a clever way to use data uh, from social network that was valuable enough for a company that he sold it for about $150 million. Um, so again, that's all data driven and, and so many people now are saying, okay, there's data, what can I build from that? Uh, smart buildings, one of the manufacturing companies I'm looking, I'm working with are actually looking to put sensors in some of their building material to see sources of failure. You know, think of a big high rise, you know, is the cement in that going to fail or the window panes um, maybe wearing out, you know, that talk about, about risk. Right, if something goes wrong, there's a big lawsuit, but it's also for maintenance costs and things like that. I mean, I, I just, I get a kick out of reading the news and how many industries have become data-driven. Farming is a big one, right? You think of that, you know, if you're going to be a stereotype, the stereotypical farmer and is, um, you know, weeding the fields, right? Those are, that they're probably one of the most technologically advanced with things like you know, things and droned and technical connected devices. And that makes so much sense because the scale of these farms can be massive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And I think that's where a lot of the excitement 
at least for me, <laughs> an opportunity is in the business. And again, so many of the big companies that are making news um, in a positive way with revenue is data driven. So let's go to Uber because that's almost the classic. And this is the one I did not work with Uber. The other ones we did, but this one can't take any credit for. <laughs> I did go to an interesting presentation. There's an Uber office here, and I'm a big fan. If you haven't gone to any of the meetups, um, yes, I go to data meetups. I'm that much of a nerd, but hopefully there's other nerds like me on this call because they can be really interesting. And they had the engineers from Uber actually showing they were very open with what they were doing. It was fascinating of how they actually linked all this data and the algorithms they used and the platforms they used. Really, really interesting. Um, but that's a classic where a whole company was built off data. So GPS data is sort of the one you think of. That's how you know. And I get a kick out of riding one and seeing where my little car is going, <laughs> going on the picture, if nothing else. Um, you don't have to pay, right? It's, it's all sort of data-driven payment systems, a lot of that. Um, the user rating system, you know, I can say, you can see if this driver has a good rating and all that kind of stuff. But they do a lot more than that. They can link with things like airline, pat, you know, arrival um, to kind of do trends of what demand is going to be and volume pricing and, and having the cars available to see. I was actually talking with, uh, again, I was, I'm a nerd, so when I have an Uber, I kind of ask, you know, kind of how the experience was. And that the Uber drivers were saying that was actually very helpful. They could kind of get a, a sense of, of when people were going to arrive and, and where to kind of head. And then the algorithm. So there's the data itself that they're getting, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of really interesting data they use. But then the algorithms to do, setting the pricing, how to match the drivers, all of that. So again, yes, there's cars involved, but they don't they don't buy them, right? They basically own the data. So um, really cool example of someone was thinking outside the box um, and, and using a lot of data that was out there to create this. And, and Lyft, too, and there's others. You know, I don't want to just sit in the sales pitch for Uber. But since that is so ubiquitous, I thought I would put that out there. And, and sort of my... If the excitement is in my voice didn't show, I, I'm a big fan of, of these type of ideas, and, and I've used this slide in other presentations, but this idea that if you are a business savvy person and you are in data, this is a great time for you. So either you're going to be the next Uber person, or like my friend traveling India because he sold his great API idea to a large company, all data driven, um, or even as we spent a lot of time in the beginning with your regular job, right? Are, are you showing the ROI from your project? And are you thinking of ways to benefit the business that maybe hadn't been done with business? Could you have a more efficient marketing campaign? Do you have a great new analytics algorithm that could really help with, you know, product pricing or whatever it is? So, so put your business hat on. And that, yeah, everyone, everyone loves to talk about that, that elusive data scientist that is the sexiest job of the 21st century from Harvard University. That's their famous quote, right? What makes a data scientist more than just a data person? A lot of it is that business savvy, right? Knowing how to use data for strategic business advantage. Um, and a lot of it, that I'll just talk quickly about that, that uh, last bullet, supporting organizational change. And, and that's a big thing to think of as well. So there's data, but if you're going to change the business model and the process of how things are going to work, one of the companies I'm working with is a big billion dollar multinational and they want to do a lot more data driven and very wisely, they're spending as much time on the organizational change and the business process change as anything else. So yes, you can, you know, how, how we do we use an Uber and how we use a taxi is very different. Um, that's just a, a personal, non, you know, what do you call it, a consumer example. Um, this can happen in the organization. If you're if you're changing how people are doing business, don't forget that there's an organizational and a training and a business process change as well. So, in summary. Um, the data-driven economy is not a buzzword, it's a real thing. Um, and, and companies that are embracing that really are doing doing better, not only with their core business, things like reducing costs, increasing revenue, minimizing risk. And hopefully I gave you some tools in your toolkit that at least maybe one of them was new that you hadn't thought of a way to kind of monetize your data. Um, and then this idea of new products and services. Could it be something like analytics sold back to your customers or a new product, you can data-driven product, or are you that unicorn that's really going to have that brand new business model with data that is publicly available or you can purchase or you can you can leverage with some of the new scalable data platforms? That's, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, I've got some data, weather data nerd friends. Um, and one of my 
friends who's in weather was actually the the son of a father who was in weather. <laughs> and these are their dinner conversations. He said, son, the amount of data you are able to get. Now, we had a building that housed even just a, a fraction of that data. They had a whole up in Wyoming, a whole data center, and they still do. Um, but the, the amount of um, processing power that's available either in the cloud or on a laptop or in a lot of these big data systems, you can do a lot of these analytics and store a lot of data that you just couldn't before. Um, so you do have uh, data at your fingertips that you didn't have. Um, so this is us. We do it for a living. If you're interested, uh, more importantly, uh, there's some upcoming webinars. So again, if you can join us next month on Data Lakes, which actually ties into what I just said, there's a lot more scalable platforms out there that weren't available before. Uh, catch some of the, this will be on demand after the, the session. And I'm going to pass it back uh, to Shannon to open it up for Q&A. Hi, Donna. Thank you so much for another great presentation. Uh, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, I will be sending a follow-up email for this particular webinar by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording and anything else requested throughout. If you've got questions, go ahead and submit them in the bottom right-hand corner in the Q&A section of your screen for Donna. Um, I see a couple questions coming that have been gone through in the chat for a bit more. Uh, um, so what would have been the ROI on that? BT program. I'm not sure what he meant. Well, the the actual the the, the benefits were 800 million dollars that they were able to quantify. I'm not sure what the percentage was, um, but that was the money they had quantified from that data quality improvement program. That's incredible. It is incredible. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, no matter what percentage that is, that's a, that's a nice uh, little savings there. Yeah. <laughs> no questions, everybody? Is it summer? Is it too hot? Or is it too cold in the southern hemisphere for y'all? Like, <laughs> yeah. oh, there's one I, um, so if you've got questions, submit them in the Q&A section. But um, I see how to monetize data. I'm doing that today, but I don't see how the architecture is being leveraged. Um, the architecture is being leveled. Well, the architecture can be leveraged in several ways. So in one sense, there's the data architecture. So actually, if we go back to the um, telco example we mentioned, their whole effort started with, I'm sorry, the energy company, it started with a data architecture project, basically even looking at what, what types of data, the big buckets of data, um, and how, which data we start with. So that was more of an enterprise architecture architecture, but also the physical architecture. So think of Uber and, and Lyft. They can only do that because of the processing power of a lot of these systems that aren't available before. So, or the energy company, they move from relational databases to Hadoop. The, um, the shipping company I mentioned, they're doing kind of real-time data streaming on a whole new data hub platform. So part of it, and that's a good point, but a part of it is knowing what to do, and then part of it is making sure you have that data architecture foundation to be able to scale. Because a lot of these ROI or the data monetization is kind of built on some of the scale, and that, that that's what's different than what was the, that we didn't have before. Yes, we've had weather data for a lot, but we're able to scale it and, and make it real-time and pass it out to folks. Um, the next one I see, I'm going to answer because I'm excited to answer it. Um, the question was, data governance is often driven by taking out costs and reducing risk. How do you see it driving revenue? Love that question um, because I'm a big fan of data governance. Is, there's two parts. There's the carrot and there's the stick. And the, the stick is often don't do this, don't do that. And it's something that you need, right? I, I don't want to share PI. Look, we have this new great data platform in this cloud where we can do exploratory analytics and yeah, please don't put customer PII out there. And I've seen customers get that wrong and had fines and it was horrible. Um, but what I like to do with governance, it's all about collaboration because most people, well, all people generally in the, in the company are in adults, right? And it's more about, uh, do we have visibility into what other people are doing it, what other people are doing? And I often call kind of your steering committee a collaboration team. And so uh, one of the companies I'm working with now, again, is a multi they're actually looking at to do uh, data monetization. And it's actually driven from their data governance team where they have all the teams across the globe and they get together and they say, what are we working on? And are we doing, are we, do we have redundant efforts? Um, are we prioritizing efforts in the same way? So that's sort of your typical governance. 
But the reason I do that is, and then what's the aha moment? How can we work together of, oh, I didn't know you had the, this information. Could we use it this way? Um, and that's how I see governance driving revenue because it, it gets to those new ideas that people hadn't thought of. And also with governance, it's often by definition cross-functional. And that's where you have um, marketing in the room with sales, with um with, with development, uh, with data folks. There was one retail company I worked with, one of my favorite quotes in data governance ever, and I was on the phone so I couldn't hug the man, which is probably good because it would have freaked him out. Um, but we had done basically a pure data architecture. It was sponsored by marketing initially, but basically of customer email address and how it cascaded across the systems or how it didn't. And we were able to see that it didn't cascade to the loyalty program. So someone had changed their email and the most loyal customers their email wasn't changed in their loyalty program, and it was frustrating. They couldn't they couldn't ship information correctly because address was information was wrong, and they had all we were able to link just email address and, and physical address back to real. That was that first phase of um, kind of the data monetization. We had the head of sales saying, "Shouldn't we kind of sponsor some sort of data cleanup, and shouldn't we govern our salespeople better?" <laughs> I just said, yeah, what, who, the head of sales ever said that, right? But he said that because he was able to see the impact. And he was bought in and he was the biggest fan of governance because he saw how that would solve his problem. So long-winded answer to two. One, it can help justify why we need to do these things. That was the example of sales. Or it could get the right people in the right room to have those new aha moments of engineering could say, I didn't know we had data on customer usage patterns. We could build new product X as a result of that. So it's both. It's that collaboration part of governance rather than just the slapping people on the wrist part of governance. Sorry, I got excited about that one, but I'm, I'm passionate about that topic because I've seen it work in a bunch of companies. <laughs> um, so um, starting back in here, so what is the best way to overcome a business uh, reluctance to spend the money needed to actually get a program properly launched? So I I would say going back to that first um, section we had on the or let me see if I can find my own slides which you've seen I've not had luck with um, if you can quantify ways that this can optimize revenue minimize costs and reduce risk that's often how you can overcome the reluctance I'm also a big fan if you've seen some of my other presentations I'll literally, literally tell the story and draw picture. Here's your customer. Here's the, the their customer journey. Uh, I often link data issues right back to the customer journey. For, and if, if anyone's doing any design thinking or agile development, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, here's my customer from day, I'm just talking retail, I don't know what the requester's business was. You know, they're trying to find our product on the website and they want to purchase and that isn't linked or we're not giving them enough information at the marketing funnel or whatever. And often, in addition to the numbers, you often have to have the numbers too, but that kind of wins the hearts and minds because data can be very difficult to understand. And I myself, if it's not my project and someone's talking about why they need HANA or Hadoop or whatever, even my eyes glaze over. But telling that story, if we could get all of the customer pipeline information and link that to our loyalty program, we could do great analytics on why from source to target we have the best customers or whatever it is. Or we could do new campaign X or we could have new product X. And I would also focus on, especially for selling to business people, some of the revenue opportunities and not only the risk and, and cost, they just, it's easier for people to get excited about new shiny things. So tie it as well as those three buckets of optimize, minimize, and reduce. And show them realistically I'm, uh, that I kind of showed in the beginning. Show them that, yes, it's going to cost more in the beginning, but bear with us. All those cool things I just said, give us six months, and then you'll start seeing the value. And, and you may have to, you know, take a little risk in committing to that. But that often kind of telling that story helps them understand that, yes, there is an upfront cost, but it will pay off, believe me, that kind of thing. So, you know, along those same lines, you know, kind of what these last few questions have been, you know, would you comment on building executive sponsorship? We get that question a lot in a lot of different ways and in, in, in a lot of different webinars. Yes, um, and I'm always a big fan. If you've been to any of my workshops, I always start uh, with just kind of what's your elevator pitch. Um, and I think you have to have that for any, you know, what's the, the, the elevator pitch is the classic. You're in the elevator with the CEO and he asks you what you're working on. And how are you going to explain that in over two floors? And so why is the project you're doing exciting? Um, so often we'd love to sell it to the CEO, 
But what other groups, so when you put together these pain points, who would be your advocates? Is it marketing? Could they be bought in? Often come to the meetings with someone like that. Is it supply chain that would love to have better data and have them do some speaking for you? I'm a big fan of that. So you can tell the story and you should. Do interviews. Go, go talk to some people in the field. Can you talk to – I actually went to a, a retail store and talked to one of the sales guys, surprised the heck out of him, asking him questions about data. But what surprised me, he immediately got it. He said, yes, if I had data on this YD, I could sell more. And I brought that story back to the C-level. He said, I went to one of your stores and I asked one of your sales guys. And he said he could sell more product if he had why. Um, and so, again, just be kind of creative. And it, yes, do the numbers, but it's often those stories you tell that really sell it. And, and have other people on your team, not just yourself, saying it. Get some advocates. Well, Donna, thank you so much. But I'm afraid that does bring us to the top of the hour here. Thank you for another great presentation. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do and all the great questions. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this presentation with links to the slides, links to the recording, and uh, in, so and anything else. Um, again, Donna, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. As you've got posted up there, next, we hope to see you all next August, August 23rd on Data Lake Architecture. Oh, a really great topic. I know that's a hot topic. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Donna. Thank you. Bye.